namely, what is the problem Judaism is trying to solve and what is the solution? Well, Judaism is the hardest of all these religions to answer that question for. <laughs> mm. And I really, I wrestled with it. I spoke with a lot of my Jewish friends. I, I did a lot of reading and thinking. But my take on it is that Judaism is the way of exile and return. The problem is exile. The problem is, is that we are apart from God, apart from our community, and we need to return. We need to get back to God and back to our community. And this has antecedents in the exile of the Jews from the Promised Land, the exile of the Jews from the Temple. Um, but I think that's the main theme. Mm. And what is the technique that Judaism recommends for overcoming exile? Well, I think the techniques are really two. Um, they're, they're storytelling and law. And, they're, and the two are connected. And they're connected most clearly, perhaps, in the, in the Passover Seder, the table meal that's, that Jews celebrate to remember the story of the exodus of the Israelites from bondage in Egypt into freedom through the wilderness into the promised land, where you're told to remember. And to remember is a commandment. It's a, it's a good deed. It's a mitzvah. And so to tell a story, in other words, is to follow the law, because the law is to remember and to tell the story. Two different sides of the same coin. Mm. And you say with the story and the law, it's a wrestling in Judaism between the old and the new. That's right. And, you know, this is one thing I love about Judaism is there's – it isn't so much about doctrine. It isn't so much here's the creed. Mm. I mean you can find creeds. You can find, you know, lists of, of, of things that Jews believe. But for the most part, Judaism isn't about belief. It's not really a belief system in the same way. It's more of a, of a story system or a legal system. And, and the word Israel comes from this idea of wrestling, wrestling with God. And so it's a tradition that isn't so much about here are the five things you have to believe in order to be Jewish because you can be Jewish and not even believe in God. Um, it, it's more about engaging the tradition, wrestling with the story, wrestling with the law, trying to figure out what it's all about. And so there is a sacred scripture. There is a holy book. As you called it the Tanakh, probably most people would know it as the Torah. What's, what is that? Well, the Torah is this, you know, wonderfully expansive term. I mean, it's it's typically translated as law, but it, it really means teaching. And it refers to classically the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But it also means the entire Hebrew Bible, um, which is to say the prophetic books of, say, Isaiah um, and Amos, and then the Ketuvim, the writings, which includes the Proverbs, the Psalms, uh, Song of Songs, Job, etc. But there's even the idea that the word Torah means uh, debating all these things, talking about all these things, or even um, the conversation of Jews in Israel is also understood to be teaching or law in, in the sense of Torah. And that debating is really captured in the Talmud, which is almost a, a, a document that accompanies the Torah or the Tanakh, Right. That's right. And it's a re reflection that the rabbis have put together. Uh, rabbi means teacher, um, and that's the name for Jewish leaders. And they uh, look at the Talmud as this repository of debates about what to do under, under particular uh, legal circumstances so that we can figure out how we're going to live our lives, which is a key question, a big question that Judaism asks. You know, how, how do we live our lives in following the commandments of God? Now, you say at one point that this was a religion born long after Abraham and Moses died. So how would you describe the founding or the founder of Judaism, or isn't there one? I, I, what I finally come down to is it's between the temple destruction of the 6th century BCE mm -hmm. and the temple destruction of the 1st century. So somewhere in that space is the time that we start to get this tradition that is not wedded to a temple. It's not wedded to a place. It's portable. It's textual. You can carry the book under your arm. You can carry the text. That's the key piece, the portability of the tradition. And it, it starts sometime between in that seven centuries of space there. Mm. Now, sometimes Judaism today doesn't seem quite as portable, and it's linked in a lot of people's minds with the state of Israel. So where does Judaism stop and Israel begin? Well, 
Israel is not the most populous Jewish country in the world. The United States is. But, you know, Israel is the visible spot, right? This is the exile and return story that I highlight in the in the chapter of the book on Judaism, that here is a people who have this story of being in covenant with God and going outside of the areas that they were intended for, whether that's Eden and whether that's the promised land, moving into exile and then wanting to go back. And here is the is the return that happens in the modern period with the foundation in the 1940s of the state of Israel. And so, yes, Judaism is very much uh, understood to be about Israel. And yet there are Jews all over the world who have now chosen, even though there is a Jewish state, to stay in the so-called diaspora, right, to stay in the exiled space. And that continues to be something that Jews have to make sense of. You know, how can you be a part of this people that has longed for millennia for returning to their promised land and now that they have it, to choose not to go? And another angle on this is what constitutes anti-Semitism? This comes into the news every so often. Is it possible to critique the state of Israel or the policies or the political leaders of the state of Israel without being anti-Semitic? Yeah, that's right. And that certainly comes up all the time in the news. You know, um, to what extent uh, can you say, look, um, I'm opposed to this particular policy, but I'm not opposed to Judaism. And I think, you know, uh, the, the memory of the Holocaust is very keen, as it should be. And it's not that long ago that um, Germans were, you know, killing killing Jews in, in World War II and uh, really very much motivated by, I believe, uh, Christian theology, uh, among other things. And so there's reasons to be suspicious of people who are critical of the state of Israel. That said, I don't think there's any state that we should consider outside of criticism. I mean, we certainly as Americans feel we're able to criticize our own um, state. I think um, most Israelis believe that they can criticize their own, uh, the actions of their own state. And I don't see why people c- can't say, look, I support the state of Israel, but I don't support what they did in this case or in, you know, or in that case. You also said Judaism, of course, is a religion of law. And there are lots of laws. Anybody who's ever looked at the book of Leviticus can, you know, go blurry-eyed at the number of minute kinds of laws and regulations, many of which would have no application in the world today, or some of which would appear incredibly harsh. Even things like the dietary laws, which very Orthodox Jews still follow, sound a little odd to outsiders. How would you characterize the Jewish approach to law? Well, a lot of the law comes from the Torah, you know, comes from the Hebrew Bible, but much of it comes from the Talmud. So it's a lot of it's post-biblical, too. Um, I think it's a tradition that believes that God tells us how to live. And uh, God doesn't just tell us how to live in generalities, like be nice to each other. Um, But God tells us how to live in very specific ways, um, including what we should eat. And you also say that uh, probably the major motif in Judaism is liberation, the movement from slavery to freedom, if you will, in the Exodus, a highly influential motif, including in our own civil rights movement. That's right. I, I, I think there's actually no story that's more influential in American history than the Exodus story. And I'm not speaking now of American Jews. I'm speaking of Americans in general. I mean, this was the story of a people, the Israelites, who found themselves enslaved under the Pharaoh in Egypt. And God called them out of of slavery into freedom. And you hear, you know, President Obama talks about, okay, there was the Moses generation of Martin Luther King, where King said, you know, I've been to the mountaintop, I've looked over, I've seen the promised land. But he he's killed. He doesn't get there. Like He's like Moses. And, and Obama talks about, oh, the Joshua generation, the generation that does get there, the next generation. But this is something we've seen with Mormons going across to the West, um, seeing Brigham Young as their Moses, leading the people, the new Israelites. Americans have seen themselves as the new Israel. They've seen the uh, Native Americans as the Canaanites. Um, There's this real sort of literal infusion of American history into the Bible story so that God is not only the God of the Israelites, but God is the God of Americans. And this story lives, of course, among Jews as the story that reminds them every Passover we should live our lives not just remembering the Passover story in the past, but as if 
we were enslaved as if we were moving through the wilderness, as if we were seeking out our own our own freedom. It's a wonderful story, and it's very much an American story as well as a Jewish story. And in fact, you say that Judaism, it's the smallest in numbers of all the eight major religions you discuss in your book, but it has an influence way beyond its numbers. How so? Well, that's right. And, you know, this this gets me in trouble sometimes because, because you know, you start talking about the influence of of Jews in world history and in American life, etc. You know, um, there's been some pretty bad uses of those kinds of arguments. But the fact of the matter is, you know, in looking at a book like this where I'm trying to say, okay, what are the eight great religions? What are the eight most influential religions in the world? You know, is Judaism one of them? Well, in terms of its numbers, it's pretty small. You know, there aren't that many more Jews in the world than there are people in the city of Mumbai in India. You mm-hmm. know, about 14 million, maybe 15. So it's pretty small. And yet, you know, Judaism gives us the two great monotheistic uh, religions outside of Judaism. It gives us Christianity and Islam, which are both outgrowths of Judaism. And those account for half of the world's population. So there's a huge influence there. If you go to the American culture, Jews are influential in politics in in much greater numbers than their their numbers in the population, right? I mean, we, we have now probably about to have three Jews on, this, on the Supreme Court. We have, you know, greater representation of Judaism in the House and in, in the Senate. We haven't had a Jewish president yet. So um, Judaism has, you know, an influence on American culture, on American political culture, on American uh, popular culture. Some of my favorite comedians are Jewish comedians, yeah. and that's because the majority of American working comics are Jewish. Um, I, and I don't think that that's entirely coincidental. You know, I think there's a long tradition of wrestling in Judaism with the absurdities of life, the hypocrisies of the high and mighty, including um, the caprice of God. And that's funny. And Jews have made a lot of that. And they've entertained themselves and they've entertained, uh, entertained the rest of us too. Stephen Prothrow is a professor of religion at Boston University and the author of God is Not One, the eight rival religions that run the world and why their differences matter. Thank you so much for joining us today, Stephen.